you're listening to Conversing the Classics. Today we're discussing the Roman poet born in 43 BC, known for both his beautiful tales of Greek myths in epic style and his sexually explicit verses on Ars Amatoria, or the art of love. Joining me today to discuss the life, work and legacy of the Roman poet Ovid is Dr. Martin Brady, college lecturer in the UCD School of Classics. Dr. Brady, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. So, let's just jump straight into it. A lot of ancient authors, particularly from the first century BC, you only get fragments of their work still existing. How much of Ovid's work still survives? Pretty much all of it, which is uh, quite surprising for a classical figure. And uh, among other things, it's testament to his popularity in late antiquity and in the early Middle Ages that uh, he was interesting enough for people to keep copying him and Mm -hmm. keep reading him and to stay inspired by his work Mm -hmm. and producing other versions of the myths that he told. The only significant gap that we have in the collection that we know Ovid wrote is a tragedy called the Medea which uh, he would have written around about the height of his poetical career, just before the Metamorphoses. Sadly, that's probably the biggest miss mm. that we have uh, in the whole of his collection. And because... is it related to, um, is he taking it from Euripides' Medea, similar to uh, a lot of his other work, transferring Greek into Roman? Best guess is, yes, it would be some sort of yeah. Roman adaptation of Euripides. Euripides and Ovid are probably two of the most sensitive readers of and interpreters of and writers of women in the ancient world. Mm. It's something I'll be talking a bit about further down the line if we get a chance to talk Mm. about the Heroides, the way that Ovid is interested in adopting and taking on the woman's voice and looking at myth from a feminine perspective. Mm. Euripides had the same sorts of ideas. It was Mm. the Euripidean tragedy and Euripidean women are a significant Mm. kind of inspiration for Ovid himself in looking at ways of constructing myth Mm. through the ideas and the the mindsets of the Mm. women who were its participants. Now, the other thing about ancient authors is that you usually get their work surviving or some of their work uh, in, in most cases, but we actually don't know anything or very little anyway about the authors themselves. How much do we know about Ovid's early life and indeed his the education in his early years? Again, we know much more for, I won't say definite, because I'm something of a sceptic mm. about even what seem to be the most easily establishable facts about the ancient world. Mm. But with Ovid, the tradition, I think, inclines us more towards acceptance of the evidence than towards a healthy scepticism. Most of what we know about other ancient poets, as you say, it's uh, conjecture, it's hypothesis, and a lot of the biographies of other ancient poets like Virgil seem to have been written by extrapolation from their works. Mm -hmm. Virgil, for example, wrote the Georgics, Mm -hmm. which was a manual on how to farm. Therefore, he must have been a gentleman farmer Mm -hmm. to some sort of degree, so their lives are shaped by their works. Mm -hmm. Ovid, though, almost uniquely among ancient writers, will have a kind of autobiographical Mm. poem that he put together, Tristia, Book 4, Poem 10, which gives us an extraordinary amount of detail in Ovid's own words, in Ovid's own voice about his early life, about his upbringing, about his education, Mm. all of which seems to chime with what we know about what life would be like Mm. about four senatorial candidates for Mm. the minor aristocracy of the period. He grew up as a member of the nobility in a provincial town, Solmo, Mm. which is deep in the Apennines. He grew up in an era where the distinction between Italian and Roman was becoming more and more blurred, Mm. where Italians were becoming more and more accepted to the heart of Roman political and cultural and noble life. So his education had him fast-tracked had he been so interested to become a Roman senator sometime during his 20s. His life took him in other directions. Mm. After that, he wasn't as interested in politics as he was in literature and in language and in simply playing about with ideas and with myths of the ancient Greek world. But we know that his life would have followed the pattern of 
a traditional Roman nobleman, mm. Italian nobleman of the period, mm. uh, fast tracking him towards a senatorial and an administrative career mm. in the vastly expanded bureaucracy of the early imperial, the early Augustan mm. uh, period. And other than, I mean, you just said Tristi as sort of a, an autobiographical work in that sense, are there any other works by later authors or contemporaries that also give us ideas about his life? We have a little bit in the histories of Tacitus in his annals where he talks about Ovid being exiled to Tomis, to Romania, uh, towards the end of his life, which is the first kind of near contemporary source telling us about uh, Ovid's banishment. But for the most part, what we know about Ovid tends to be given to us in Ovid's own words by figures by himself, uh, about himself and figures mm. of his particular generation. Mm -hmm. So most of what we know is in Ovid's own voice, which is, of course, interesting yeah. and unique in itself mm -hmm. in that that's so rare among any kind of poet yeah. or any kind of significant figure from the ancient world. OK, and then obviously you said he's fast-tracked for this senatorial position. How does he make the jump from holding judicial posts like that to becoming a poet? Really, it's a matter of what he wanted out of life versus what his father seems to have wanted for him out of life, and of it maturing to the point where he followed his own path, mm. his own way, rather than his father's desires. And it all goes back to Ovid's brother, who was, as Ovid tells us, one year older than him, mm. who died quite young, who was the member of the family who was most interested in pursuing senatorial career. Mm. It seems that Ovid was railroaded onto the same track to fill the gap that was left by his dead brother, but that he was able to assert himself enough to say, look, no, I don't want to follow the judicial path. I don't want to go down the political course. I'm much more interested in literature mm. and in mythology and storytelling than I am about constructing mm. arguments at a court of law. We do have the elder Seneca, who, among other figures of the period, reminisces about Ovid's judicial talents and his speech writing in his early career. And Seneca does tell us that his experience of Ovid was that even while he was training for the bar, even while he was training in loyalty techniques, he was much more interested in storytelling mm. and in the power of words and the power of ideas than he was about the merits or otherwise of his case. Mm. That he was more interested, in, in other words, in being clever for its own mm. sake than in being successful mm. in the law courts. It may have been a lack of success in legal terms that drove him down mm. a literary path, or it may just have been that he saw that his talents were more fruitfully kind of pushed in the literary direction rather than the judicial mm. direction. Either way, whichever it was, I think most lovers of literature, most lovers of story are really glad that he made that kind <laughs> of leap. <laughs> yeah, now, and that brings us into the next point, actually. His first major work is called The Amores, which means mm -hmm. in English, The Loves. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and, of course, how it was received by the contemporary Roman audience? Loves, love poetry, yes. It's a genre of literature which flourished from round about 50 BC to round about the middle of Ovid's own career. Uh, I have a suspicion that Ovid was so clever in the way that he handled it that he ended up stifling the genre and that's why no major love poets in the Roman era came along uh, after mm. uh, Ovid. But it was a popular genre of poetry going back to Catullus and particularly I think interesting to Ovid in that the underlying motif is of a poet who's not interested explicitly and fervently disinterested mm. in military and political and judicial matters and explicitly asserting his love of the life of Dalions, shall we say, mm. to give it an appropriately kind of elevated <laughs> uh, sort of description because it is a kind of stylized world. It's a world yeah. rather similar to romance novels of the 17th and 18th century in that it posits some sort of idealised world where a lover and a beloved can meet. 
and can engage with uh, one another. It entails a rejection of belonging to the world of politics, which would be scandalous for a people such as the Romans, for mm. whom the political world and the military world and the judici judicial world were, you know, these were the three careers which Roman noblemen were expected to follow. So there was something almost countercultural, like America in the 1960s, about rejecting these kinds of values. Mm -hmm. One might say that Ovid and Catullus and their contemporaries yeah. were the original hippies <laughs> in, in that sort of sense. So on one level, it's simply a way of asserting that you stand with these people yeah. in pursuing the life of romance and literature ahead of the life of political and military and judicial service mm. to the state. Ovid throws in his own twists, of course. He cannot resist but do otherwise because of his creativeness and his inventiveness. Mm. First of all, his girlfriend is a woman whom he gives the name of Corinna, which is originally the name of a female Greek poet mm. of the early pre-classical uh, Greek period. So, again, that indicates his allegiance to the life of poetry mm -hmm. rather than more serious concerns. Mm -hmm. But he's also playing with the notion, is Corinna a real woman or is she just a poetic construct? Mm -hmm. Is she a fiction that mm -hmm. Ovid's made up for the intent of writing love poetry? He wants to write love poetry first of all, so he has to find a beloved. He has to conjure the idea of her out of fresh air mm -hmm. in order to write poetry about her. Mm. Ovid is probably not the first guy ever to have had a made-up girlfriend, <laughs> but he's certainly the first to have flaunted the fact so readily and so obviously that he made her all up yeah. for the sake of a poetic fiction. Mm. Because this is one of the themes of his work at large, that mm. he flirts with the idea of you know what is true, what isn't true. Mm. He plays with the ideas of truth and fiction. Yeah. He's not one to let truth get in the way of a good story or a good poem or a yeah. good idea mm -hmm. for a work of literature. Yeah. So the reception of the Amore seems to have been somewhat complicated by this. It's yeah. not really authentic mm. love poetry and readers like Quintilian, the Roman literary scholar of the second century AD, seem to have recognised this. Mm -hmm. It also seems to be reflected in a tradition which Ovid mentions that he had to repackage and republish the Amores. There were originally five books, he mm. claims. He has to edit them down to three, mm. presumably to get some of the dross out of the way to make a more kind of tightly focused, yeah. more kind of compact selection for his Roman readers. Mm. Like so many poets, so many literary figures who are in love with their own cleverness, sometimes he doesn't really seem to know where to stop. Yeah. And this tradition seems to reflect that. Mm. Now, after this, then, he goes on to write the Epistolae Herodium, which is the epistles of the heroines in English, and the Medicamina Facii, the art of beauty. Could you briefly talk about these two works and, again, how they are received? Two works, again, which are about... The feminine perspective, the Heroides letters of heroic women mm. about the great myths of Greek antiquity seen from the perspective of the women who yeah. participate in them. The Metacarmina is a more prosaic kind of work, uh, a poem but on a prosaic theme mm. about uh, makeup uh, and about how a woman should fashion her face and her physical identity, mm -hmm. her physical appearance, in order to appeal to men. Mm -hmm. So they're both works in different ways about, quote, constructing, unquote, women, whether in the abstract sense, mm. in a literary term, how do you construct a woman yeah. within a myth on a page, or how do you construct your face physically yeah. in order to make yourself more beautiful, more alluring to men. So on the one hand, these are works about women, on the other hand, the role that women take, as so often in history, mm. is of course as participants in the stories of men, yeah. either in the mechanic Carmina as objects of love, as objects yeah. of affection, or in the Heroides yeah. as the kind of secondary players in but, the major stories. But for an ancient author, he is quite pro-women, I suppose you could say, in contrast to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
More so than most authors, he seems to be in sympathy with the feminine point of view. Mm. He seems to understand the powerlessness, this comes through strongly in the Heroides, mm. the powerlessness of women who are participants in these stories but have no way of changing the roles mm. that they play. Or if they do attempt to take ownership of their roles, to take ownership of their place in myth and in life, mm. then they are derided as strange and alien beings who are totally and thoroughly out of place. Mm. People like Medea, who, God help her, Medea, a woman who chooses to assert yeah. herself, and she turns out because of this to be branded as a witch, and actually, a harpy. I can use this as a, a point to plug. If you haven't already listened to our podcast with Dr. Martina Kuypers of Trinity College Dublin on Medea, you should go do that after this one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he is, I mean, you know, he's, he's obviously a forward thinker. In, in, in a Roman sense, I suppose in a modern sense he'd be, he wouldn't be so much. Now, we couldn't talk about Ovid without mentioning the Ars Amatoria, as I mentioned earlier, the art of love. It's known for being quite, ex, a, quite an explicit piece of writing. Firstly, what exactly is it dealing with? And again, how is it received? It's ostensibly a poem which is teaching the techniques of seduction. Mm. how to make yourself appealing to women. Mm. And there's an appendix as well, a very substantial one. The third book of the Ars Amatoria is also pitched at women. How do they make themselves appealing mm. and alluring to men? Mm. So in one sense, I've seen it described as a kind of equivalent to Dale Carnegie in the ancient world, how to win friends and influence people, mm. particularly people of the opposite uh, gender. And can this book be used as um, a grounds to try and understand further the ancient psyche and how they perceived love and such? Or is it, again, very much sort of poetic fiction? I wouldn't say so much the ancient psyche, more the ancient kind of literary imagination mm. in that the techniques that he teaches in the Ars Amatoria tend to be the techniques which he's already expressed himself as using in the Amores, mm. for example, in order to attract this fictional woman, Corinna, mm. or that Catullus uses to attract his girlfriend, Lesbia, yeah. mm. or that Tibullus or Propertius or other Roman love poets use. So it's kind of, read in that sense, it's a sort of how-to guide to how to write love poetry, mm. how to write convincing love poetry, mm. how to make yourself appealing to the beloved of erotic literature. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of literary manual, a kind of literary handbook in that sense. Mm -hmm. The advice that it gives is also immensely practical. Uh, and this is where I'd say maybe not the ancient psyche, but maybe just the human psyche mm -hmm. in general of it seems to have a very decent handle on that. Mm -hmm. The techniques which he teaches, you know, for example, to women are to appear alluring but not desperate mm -hmm. to resist at the same time as they try to seduce mm -hmm. so to be chased and not too readily caught mm -hmm. the advice that he gives to men is to be persistent but respectful and the respectful side of the agenda mm -hmm. is perhaps something that men forget in too many eras. Mm. He is of the belief that the relationship between a man and a woman is a relationship between equals, mm. that they each have their roles to play, that a love affair is kind of like a staged production mm -hmm. in which each party is filling a particular predefined role, mm -hmm. a role that's defined both by human culture and by the human psyche mm -hmm. in general. So it's both a work of great literary sophistication in that it draws these techniques from other examples of ancient yeah. literature, but also a work of great kind of psychological hmm. perception in that he seems to put his finger on the essential truths of how men and women behave in the company of each other mm. and how one can exploit those behavioural mm. patterns in order to appear the more alluring, the more mm. enticing mm. to people whom you're trying to seduce mm. and you're trying to impress. Mm. So a genuine 
work of psychological insight. Mm. What it is not is how it was taken by many Romans of the period, which is a how-to guide on adultery. Mm -hmm. That was how Augustus seems to have taken it. Mm -hmm. uh, Augustus was a great kind of traditionalist. In U.S. politics, he would certainly be a Republican <laughs> of a strongly <laughs> fundamentalist persuasion. He had a kind of back-to-basics mentality. Mm. His belief seems to have been, or he seems to have projected the idea that he believed that the Ars Amatoria was a manual for young rakes to seduce otherwise happily married mm. and virtuous noble women mm -hmm. to make cuckolds out of their husbands. Mm -hmm. Ovid is most avowedly not teaching that. Mm -hmm. He is not trying to destabilize Roman morality in that sort of sense. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's very easy, particularly reading from a fundamentalist kind of perspective, to make those mistakes and not see those sorts of nuances. Yeah. And that seems to have been a factor in the later reception of Ovid mm. among the elites in Roman society, and particularly the political elites and mm. Augustus and his circle. Mm -hmm. The story of his exile, the story of his falling out of favour yeah. with Augustus and subsequent punishment yeah. is a bit more complicated yeah. than that, of course, and uh, I'm sure we'll have the chance to talk yeah, about that, we'll that further down the line, on. but uh, that seems to have yeah. been the basis of it in the Ars Amatoria. And then back to the actual Ars Amatoria itself. I couldn't talk about it without like, talking about the opening because it is it does have possibly one of my favourite openings of any piece of classical literature, particularly the Muse invocation. He sort of makes fun of, I think it's Hesiod's opening and obviously Homer as well, invoking the Muse. Can you talk about this and also sort of the more satirical side of Ovid's writings? Certainly, I mean, you, you bring up Homer and Hesiod there. Certainly, Ovid is interested in what makes these more ancient authors tick and also in poking fun at the kinds of ideas and ideologies that they're building yeah. their literature and their poetry uh, around. Yeah. And Hesiod in particular in this case. Yeah. Hesiod's the original didactic poet, mm. by which I mean a poet whose poetry is intended explicitly to teach mm. the reader something. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's something that Ovid has already played with in the Medicamina mm. that we talked about a few minutes ago about, you know, teaching women the best way to paint their face, mm -hmm. the best way to wear makeup. Mm -hmm. So a ludicrous subject around which to construct something mm -hmm. as supposedly serious as a didactic yeah. poem. And the Ars Amatoria, similarly, that's part of the joke there, yeah. that this is a serious genre of literature which in other people's hands, like Hesiod, is intended to convey yeah. both immensely practical and immensely moral mm. kinds of lessons that Ovid is using for a decidedly frivolous mm. and playful kind of subject. Yeah. So that's part of what he's doing in the introduction to the Ars Amatoria, mm. that he's signalling that this is a kind of playful text, that it's taking a serious form of literature, mm. but deliberately trying to do something a little bit more fun, a little bit more amusing, yeah. a little bit more lowbrow mm. with this kind of material. And the other thing which I get about the introduction to the Ars Amatoria is particularly this emphasis on the Latin term Ars, which yeah. is roughly, if not necessarily accurately, translated yeah. by the English term art. Yeah. Art in this sense being not something which is inspired by the creative kind of talents of the gods, mm. but rather the opposite of that kind mm. of mysterious creativity. Ars in Latin signifies the kind of hard work that a craftsman mm. might put into constructing a physical object, mm. a utilitarian object, a useful kind of object, mm. a cart or a plough or whatever it might mm. be. So art is hard work from all of its kind of perspective. Mm. He sees seduction as a kind of yeah. craft equivalent to the technical skill that craftsmen might need mm. to put together a well-wrought, a well-built kind yeah. of physical object. So art in all of its sense is not just fun and tomfoolery, but it's also the kind of hard work mm. 
that goes into constructing something which is well proportioned mm -hmm. and well balanced and which appears very elegantly constructed to the eye of the outsider. Yeah. So it's fun, but it's yeah. hard work. And we've kind of mentioned it, but we haven't actually talked about it itself. I notice you have it there. Can I spring it on you to sort of read the introduction? Maybe in Latin first and then in English, just to give them a sense of what up it sounds like in the original language. Only if you can. Uh, well, this is testing my sight reading skills, but what the heck? I'm always up for a challenge. <laughs> so, uh, as amatoriae, liber primus, si quis in hoc artem populo non nobit amandi, hoc legat, et lecto carmine doctus amet. Arte, quitae velo querates ramoque moventur, arte leves curus, Arte regendus amor. Curibus automodon lentisque erat aptus habenis, tifis in haemonia pupe magister erat, me venus artificem tenero praeficit amori, tifis et automodon dicar amoris ego. And in English, if anyone among these people knows not the art of love, let him read my poem, and having read, let him be talented in love. By skill, that's mm. art, mm. our swift ship sails and rode. By skill, nimble chariots are driven. By skill also must love be guided. Mm -hmm. Automedon was well fitted for chariots and pliant raids. And Tiphys was the helmsman of the Hymonian ship. Me, Venus has set over tender love mm. as master of her art. Mm -hmm. So, not quite going into the same kind of depth there. Yeah. I appreciate your listeners probably don't want to hear reams and reams of Latin, <laughs> but I hope that gives an yeah. appropriate sense, both of what the introduction yeah. is about and about yeah. how it might sound in and Latin. And then he also goes on to say later on is, I do not need the muses to appear to me on the hillside and inspire me as I am farming cattle. You know, I, I, I already know the art of love. It's, so that's kind of the poking fun. Of, um, Nor am I prompted by the value yeah. of birds of the air. Nor did the muses' sisters appear to me while I kept flocks in your veil, Ascra. It is my experience <laughs> which inspires this work. Yeah. And experience as well, experience in ours. Yeah. Just as one might expect yeah. of a practiced yeah. craftsman. Ovid's belief in the gods seems to have been based on expediency rather than mm. genuine religious feeling. Yeah. He says elsewhere in the Ars Amatoria, well, it's convenient that there are gods. Mm. Since it's convenient, we might as well worship them. Yeah. <laughs> so. And then, again, moving on, sort of quite swiftly, we have a lot to cover. His most famous work is undoubtedly his book called The Metamorphoses. What's it about, and can you tell us a little bit more about it? Again, with Ovid, there are at least two answers to this question, and probably another two dozen more buried beneath that. To take the most obvious, first of all, The Metamorphoses is a work about metamorphosis, or about mm. transformation, or about change. It's a compendium of stories from Greek and Roman myth, uh, and all of the stories have one thing in common, that they involve the transformation of a person mm -hmm. within this story either into a person from an animal or an inanimate object, mm -hmm. or from a person into an object mm -hmm. or an animal. So transformation, on some level, is the theme of every story mm -hmm. in the Metamorphoses. More generally, it's also a story about kind of figurative transformations, mm -hmm. metaphorical changes. So change less in the literal sense, more in the sense of, for example, the way that the world has changed mm -hmm. in the classical period from a Greek-centred mm -hmm. world to a Roman-centred world. Mm -hmm. So we begin with stories that are drawn from Greek myth mm -hmm. and we end with Roman myth and then Roman history. Mm -hmm. The final transformation is the transformation of Julius Caesar into a god. Yeah. So the poem is about the transformation from Greek to Roman. Mm -hmm. The poem is also about... Uh, the transformation from a world of myth and wonder, mm. a world that is ruled over by gods in mm. all their capricious kind of moods and whims, to a world in which humans predominate. The world of the historical era, mm. 
uh, which is the more contemporary era in which Ovid finds himself. So it's a reflection on the theme of transformation mm -hmm. on a whole variety of levels. Mm -hmm. Now, putting his work aside just for a moment, in 8 AD, he is uh, supposedly, and I suppose you can address that yourself in a moment, exiled by the Emperor Augustus. Do we know anything about the grounds surrounding his exile, why it happened, where he goes, etc.? I did say earlier I was a sceptic about most facts which are presented to us by the ancient world. Mm. There are some even more sceptical than I am. Mm -hmm. One was a scholar called Andrew Fitton Brown, who published an article in the 1980s suggesting that Ovid never actually went into exile at all. Mm -hmm. He wrote an extensive series of works which were purportedly written from a town called Termis, which is modern mm -hmm. Constanza, on the Danube Delta mm -hmm. in Romania, complaining about life on the frontier, complaining about mm -hmm. the barbarians who lived there, complaining about the weather and... Uh, foreign invaders and mm. all sorts of things. Mm. There's no direct contemporary evidence that Ovid was exiled. Mm. So some of the more sceptical among us have taken this yeah. as the cue to suggest that maybe he never went into yeah. exile at all. This is simply a thought experiment and for his you, poetry. Would you believe he was exiled? I wouldn't push it quite that far. Okay. Because his description of his experiences is so vivid and so profound and speaks of such a sense of unsettlement and alienation yeah. that it's difficult to imagine him being able to think himself into this mindset mm. from a comfortable study in Rome. I think perhaps the truth of that observation is more to be found in a suggestion that really what Ovid is talking about is the general sense of what it is to be a Roman who has to travel abroad to experience the process of colonialism, mm. the process of civilization of the barbarian frontier. Mm. The imperial project, if you like, something like what Rudyard Kipling did for the British <laughs> yeah. Empire in the 19th century. <laughs> Send forth your sons to take up the white man's burden, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. The Roman man's burden, yeah. one might say, from Ovid's perspective, mm -hmm. to deliberately reject the comforts of life in Rome, in the great world capital, in order to bring the benefits of civilization to these mm -hmm. rather ungrateful and violent native people. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I think, you know, the, 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 there's a certain truth in Ovid's articulation yeah. of the experience of what it is to be a yeah. frontiersman. Yeah. For the Roman era, just so, as much for any other era. He definitely went to the frontier, but he did, wasn't necessarily exiled to it. Is that what you're saying? Do you think he visited it, or do you think that it was more so he he just sort of Again, about it? Again, he claims, and we have no other evidence but of its own suggestion, he claims to have been sent to the frontier as punishment by mm. Augustus. There's no particular reason for doubting or disputing yeah. that. So we'll accept it as a convenient fiction <laughs> for the yeah. moment. Yeah. I think looking at the reasons for that are probably more constructive yeah. as grounds for speculation. One of the reasons would be, as I mentioned earlier, the Ars Amatoria, a poem which Augustus chose or, uh, to interpret or misinterpreted mm. as a poem about the process of seduction of married women, which ran counter to a lot of Augustus's legislation on mm. family values and uh, family affairs. Mm. So Ovid was deemed to be not a right thinker mm -hmm. in that sort of sense and was banished mm. in internal mm -hmm. exile. Ovid in that sense was an inspiration to many poets who were who suffered internal exile in the Soviet mm. period, like Solzhenitsyn and mm. Brodsky, who had similar experiences of being mm. misinterpreted by totalitarian government. Mm. But Ovid also claims that there was a mistake of some sort that he made. Mm. Carmen et Errol, he calls it in the Latin, a poem and a mistake. Mm. The poem was probably the Ars Amatoria. Mm. The mistake he's deliberately silent about, mm -hmm. presumably because it would have been so personally embarrassing to Augustus to even give <laughs> the faintest hint mm. of what it was about. Mm. 
There are a number of entertaining speculations about what that mistake would have been. Mm -hmm. There's not nearly enough evidence in the ancient texts to support any of these conjectures. Mm. They remain no more than speculation. One of them is that he saw the Empress Livia, Augustus's wife, in the bath, and he accidentally took a wrong turning, uh, trying to leave Augustus's palace one day. Another speculation is that he was caught up in the affairs of the younger Julia, mm -hmm. uh, Augustus's granddaughter, who mm. was exiled in 8 AD at the same time, mm -hmm. again for similar reasons, crimes against morality. Mm -hmm. Probably the most plausible of the speculations I've encountered is that he was somehow caught up in the political machinations regarding the succession to Augustus as well. Mm -hmm. Was it going to go to Tiberius? Was the succession going to go instead to one of Augustus's natural descendants? Mm -hmm. Ovid probably, this is my best guess, was caught up in some way in these dynastic games. Fruits for a lot of speculation there, yeah. even if there's no historical mm -hmm. evidence that we can securely yeah. rely upon. But whatever the reason, I think at the very least his description of life on the frontier seems to have been authentic mm -hmm. in the way that it communicates the privations of life among a barbarian people, mm -hmm. of the absence of the comforts of civilization, mm. the comforts of Roman culture mm. in particular. It's an exaggerated picture, but the exaggeration, I think, shouldn't detract from the very real human and psychological mm. suffering yeah. that is conveyed in this work mm. in a very fluent and imaginative kind of way mm. as well. It's a very different kind of work. It's a lot less funny, mm -hmm. of course, than the rest of Ovid's work. Yeah. But there's a certain frisson in the tragedy yeah. as well. A man who started life with all these great advantages, with his wit mm -hmm. and his noble background and so on and so forth, reduced mm -hmm. by his own mistakes, by his own failings, to exile in a ramshackle hovel yeah. on the barbarian frontier. Yeah. Now, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about his influence on later authors and such. But first of all, what do we know about him towards the end of his life and his death? How much do we know? The last few years of his life, the last three or four years, uh, we know very little indeed. He seems to have stopped writing in 14 AD mm. and he died either in 17 or 18. The accepted date is 17, but there are recent arguments mm. that he might have survived right through until 18. Hmm. But he stops writing in 14, hmm. significant in that that's the year that because, Augustus yeah. himself died. That lends weight to my own speculation hmm. that he was caught up in the mechanics of the succession, hmm. because if he happened to back someone other than Tiberius, well, the wrong horse came home for him yeah. in 14 AD. There was no point in reminding the Roman people of his exile if there hmm. was no prospect of returning home. Hmm. So his last years on the Danube frontier, his last three years remain unchronicled. Mm -hmm. The years before that, we see him enduring a number of privations and a number of sufferings, mm. including for the first time in life, for example, having to don armor, having to take up arms mm. and fight as a member of the local militia mm -hmm. against the incursion of barbarian raiding parties. Mm. We see him learning to speak the local language, the barbarian tongue, mm -hmm. because there's no one there to talk Latin with. Mm -hmm. So it's all about deprivation. It's all about suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, at a late time of life, suddenly experiencing what might be expected of a more lowly Roman yeah. citizen in other parts of the empire, in other periods. So it seems to have been a long, slow, and particularly unpleasant slide into oblivion. One might imagine that death would even have come as a little bit of a release hmm. after the sufferings of those long years. Yeah. There's one poem which is particularly moving in that context, where he says he hopes that when he's buried, his soul at least can return to Rome, mm -hmm. because he couldn't stand the thought of living in some barbarian underworld mm -hmm. and having to talk in the barbarian language mm -hmm. with all the dead folks of the Romanian region rather than Rome. I hope at least on that level he got his wish yeah. on that score. <laughs> now, 
So after his death, he's obviously, he is one of the major Augustan poets. We couldn't sit in an Irish university and discuss Ovid without mentioning his influence on the works of our very own Oscar Wilde. Which of Oscar Wilde's stories draws the most inspiration from Ovid's work? There's probably most of uh, an Ovidian kind of touch in the portrait of Dorian Gray, Mm -hmm. which is his one and only novel, and that's for a wide variety of reasons. Firstly, in that it seems to be a kind of contemporary refashioning of the Pygmalion myth. Hmm. You've got a story of an artist who constructs a work of art which in a sense, comes to life. Yeah. Pygmalion composes a statue of the ideal woman, his ideal beloved. Mm-hmm. We have the portrait of Dorian Gray, which yeah. is again a portrait of the artist's mm. beloved. Mm. The portrait of Dorian Gray, in that sense, represents an artistic transformation, yeah. a metamorphosis by which a work of art takes on a life which is dependent upon the life of its creator. Yeah. But there's another sense in which Dorian Gray invokes of it, mm-hmm. and that's in the sense of a lifestyle, or a lifestyle agenda, a lifestyle ideology, mm-hmm. if you like, which it seems uh, in more and less subtle ways to be articulating. Mm-hmm. So it seems to invoke the Ars Amatoria in that sort of mm-hmm. sense. Just as the Ars Amatoria underpinned charges of immorality that were levelled at Ovid before he went into exile, Mm -hmm. so Dorian Gray, at Wilde's libel trial in 1895, is brought forward front and centre as evidence of Wilde's dissolute lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's proof that the charge that Queensbury levelled against him of Mm. being a sodomite was in fact true. Mm. And of course, truth is a defence in libel. You can't libel someone by telling them they are what they actually are. Mm. So Dorian Gray, in its pictures of masculine love, Mm -hmm. in its seeming, if rather subtle, articulation of homosexual values, Mm -hmm. underpins a portrait of Wilde as a dissolute character, mm. the same way in which the Ars Amatoria's strategies of seduction, which seem to be directed at noble women, mm. underpin charges of Ovid's dissolution, mm. of his promotion of dissolute mm. and non-conformist, non-traditional, non-approved kinds yeah. of lifestyles. So Dorian Gray works on several levels as a kind of Ovidian text, a post-Ovidian text, mm. which in the same ways as a lot of Ovid's works, underpinned charges, whether justly or not, levelled against their uh, author. Mm-hmm. So it's not just a parable about art, yeah. but also a parable in a way in which art can be read and misread mm. and deliberately misconstrued yeah. for political and judicial ends, as well as literary mm. ends. However, Despite the similarities, the stories begin to differ greatly towards the end, with the Pygmalion myth having what can only be considered a very happy ending, and the picture of Dorian Gray being a little grimmer. Do you think that this is simply because Wilde was looking to appeal to a more contemporary audience while Ovid is doing his usual thing of writing a love story? Ovid's more interested in being amusing Mm -hmm. for its own sake, Mm -hmm. of course, and... uh... Pygmalion's happy ending perhaps suggests ways in which love in particular is Mm. the hero of the metamorphoses, that it's a champion of true love and pure love. Dorian Gray is kind of more of a moralising text and the twist in the tale comes in the punishment and Mm. uh, retribution that is brought about by transformation, mm. the transformation at the end of the story. Yeah. Of course, yeah. that's a Vidian in itself, what Wilde is trying to do with the end of Dorian mm. Gray, in making transformation a kind of punishment. Pygmalion's a sort of outlier in the Metamorphoses, in that it has a happy ending. Mm. Metamorphosis is most often used as a punishment rather than a reward mm-hmm. in the Metamorphoses. Wilde seems to be taking this Ovidian theme Mm. 
an outlier example in Ovid and refashioning it to make it more like what Ovidian's, mm. the Ovidian telling of the tale should have been yeah. in the Metamorphoses. So the Metamorphoses as a series of stories seems to be emphasising morality and punishment for mm. immorality rather than rewards for yeah. moral kinds of yeah. behaviour. Wilde seems to be returning off it to his roots yeah. in that sort of sense. That And now, do you think that Wilde perhaps identified a little bit with Ovid, provided of course he knew about it, Ovid's exile, as of course Wilde famously was imprisoned for his own sexuality and probably felt quite subdued because of it, because of the society he was living in. Do you think that that's a, a possibility? Very much so, very much so. We do know that uh, Wilde would have read quite a substantial chunk of Ovid. Mm. The historical facts are less in dispute, of course, at the end of the 19th mm-hmm. century than they are back in the Augustan era, mm-hmm. to the extent that we know what the curriculum that Wilde would have read as an undergraduate in Trinity uh, and at Oxford mm-hmm. would have entailed, which would have been significant chunks, mm-hmm. significant quantities of Ovid. Mm-hmm. We can also tell, uh, I won't go into the technical details, but certain points of description and comparison in the portrait of Dorian Gray invoke various stories from the Metamorphoses. Mm. There are strong verbal similarities with the story of Actaeon, for example, Actaeon who accidentally stumbled across the goddess Diana in the bath. Wilde seems to be well aware of the details of that story and to have incorporated that story into certain passages in Dorian Mm. Gray. So the evidence that Wilde knew about of it that he knew a great deal of Ovid's yeah. work and also of the path of his lifestyle, of his career, I think is absolutely incontrovertible. Mm. And to push those comparisons forward, we also see in Wilde the same kind of tragic twist mm. that a man born with this great literary talent and with a noble heritage and uh, rich financial endowments yeah. should buy his own mistakes, his own errors, have ended up suffering so greatly in the last years of his life. And what little work that he did write from exile seems to bear out this kind of self-identification with Ovid. Mm -hmm. De Profundis in particular, the apology for his own life that he writes Mm. to Douglas from Paris in yeah. the last years of his life seems to be closely relatable to Tristia II, yeah. which is a poem that Ovid wrote addressed directly to Augustus yeah. as a kind of apology for and explanation mm. of Ovid's own artistic yeah. choices. So there are comparisons, I think, to be drawn there yeah. in their justification of and description of their sexual morality, mm. the choices that they've taken, particularly in terms of physical and intimate uh, relationships. Mm. For both of these figures, the De Profundis and Tristia too, also reflect a kind of authenticity that we don't see anywhere else in their work, anywhere else in their career. Mm -hmm. Wilde is a wit who uses the power of inversion, Mm -hmm. of inversion of ideas and the play of opposites Mm -hmm. in the same way that Ovid does as a means of generating humour and also as an easy way of conveying kind of intellect and intelligence. Mm -hmm. My dear boy, there is only one thing worse than being talked about and that's not being (laughs) talked about. Witticisms like that Mm -hmm. draw on the power of opposites, draw on the power of words and wordplay, and that's something which he shares yeah. in common with Ovid. Yeah. Too much in love, as the elder Seneca might have said of Wilde, as well as of Ovid, too much in love with his own cleverness. Mm. So there are points of comparison, strong points of comparison, yeah. in the two uh, figures' careers, which suggest that Wilde, whether explicitly or implicitly, was modelling his experiences as the suffering artist, Mm -hmm. the artist in exile, the artist in banishment, Mm. which come out in the narrative of his later years towards the end of his career. Mm. 
And do you think Wilde intended these parallels and similarities to be so distinct that people could pick up on them, or do you think it was more that he, he just sort of wanted to use it but he didn't want people to know he was using it? I'm not quite sure whether, to what extent they were intentional. Mm. I'm not quite sure whether there was an explicit desire there. Mm. I suspect it's more the case that a poet who reads himself into a kindred figure would naturally use the same kinds of motifs and strategies and techniques used by that figure mm. in his own self-representation, in his portrayal of his own life and experiences yeah. and ideology. They're simply, you know, the same person, if you like, just born in different eras, mm. in different parts of the world, and it seems with differing sexual orientations, mm. but both of which they include in their art. Mm. They make a keynote of their art, in different kinds of ways. Intention maybe perhaps is a red herring here in that it doesn't particularly matter whether Wilde intended that or not. What it does suggest is that reading Wilde as a kind of contemporary equivalent of Ovid is a fruitful way of understanding and interpreting his works and of shaping his experiences mm -hmm. as a kind of subset of the example of examples of what it's like mm. to be an artist in exile what it's like to be an artist who suffers yeah. on account of saying unpalatable things to a world that's not yet quite ready to hear them yeah if you want to be countercultural mm. in other words you have to expect the opposition of mainstream culture in whatever form that opposition takes, yeah. whether it's simply disapproval or whether it's arrest and banishment and alienation. Yeah. So I think this is a fruitful way of exploring yeah. and understanding how the two work, uh, yeah. poets related their work yeah. to the societies within which they operated and how they managed their differing kinds of countercultural tendencies. Mm. Now... To sum it all up, the question everyone always hates, what are the three most important things you'd like people to remember about Ovid and his work? And indeed, well, Oscar Wilde and the similarities, if, 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 if you so desire. Well, no, uh, Gian Biagio Conte, in his History of Latin Literature, for each of the Latin poets that he treated, he had a section on the poet's influence after they died. Mm. And he said, Ovid's influence is Western literature. <laughs> So <laughs> the first thing that people should remember is that culture, literature, mythology is basically Ovid. Hmm. That Ovid told the stories, in many cases for the first time, yeah. stories which we understand as kind of characteristic of, emblematic of, ancient myth hmm. of the ancient world in general. Actaeon, Pygmalion. Daedalus and Icarus. Mm -hmm. All of these stories, Ovid is the first to articulate in such vivid and descriptive kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So Ovid's legacy is, in a sense, the entirety of Western art and the entirety of Western imaginative literature. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that people should think of as Ovid's significance is everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Secondly, I think... It's interesting to think about Ovid as a countercultural figure mm. and to reflect on the ways in which <laughs> a figure who was such an oppositional figure in ancient politics, in mm. Augustan society, turns out to have been adapted after his death into the mainstream, mm -hmm. that Ovid is suddenly representative of the entirety of classical yeah. myth. And I think it's worth remembering with countercultural figures in our own era that as much as we might resist them now, as much as we might hate difference and people deliberately trying to be different and challenging and objectionable, mm -hmm. that those objectionable ideas to us might be the basis of all future culture and ideology and literature. Yeah. So they should teach us, I think, not to be so judgmental yeah. in handling people who are deliberately setting themselves up at the fringes. Mm. The fringe is also the frontier, if you like. Yeah. These people are ahead of their time. These people are trailblazers for future 
directions in which culture is going to go. Mm -hmm. And the last thing to remember is that Ovid is somewhat less of a creative figure than we might imagine him to be nowadays. Mm. We've touched on the influence that Euripides had for him, for example, or Hesiod, mm. or Homer. He seems original to us, mm -hmm. but in the words of Newton, he's just a dwarf standing on the shoulders <laughs> of giants. Mm -hmm. I think that's another thing worth remembering, mm. that being creative isn't necessarily about imagining ideas about out of fresh air. Mm. It's just about being more imaginative and more innovative with the ideas and the cultural identity that we already have. Mm. That you don't need to throw everything out and start all over again. Our culture is something that's been given, that's been granted to us. Mm. But we can look for ways of making it different, mm. of making it ours. We don't have to reject everything that's mm. come before just to make a mark for ourselves. There are ways of adapting that and appropriating that and making it our own, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. No. That's another thing worth remembering mm. about Ovid. You know, he teaches us how to be creative and yet at the same time to respect our traditions. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Well, in the words of Oscar Wilde, you can never be overdressed or overeducated. So if you've been listening in either your finest ball gown or sharpest tuxedo, you followed Wilde's philosophy fully. If not, you can thank Dr. Brady for ensuring at least one of half of that quote is fulfilled. Dr. Brady, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> thank you, Oscar. If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to find out more or get involved with Classical Youth Society of Ireland, you can contact us via our social media pages on www.facebook.com forward slash Classical Youth Society Ireland. You can follow us on Twitter at CYSI underscore or for any direct inquiries, you can email us cysiofficial at gmail.com. Today's podcast was edited by Michael Fuller. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you all next time.